Okay, so I think we'll continue and hopefully the others will be back here shortly. But uh, yeah, we're going to now have a look at exercise number six and then the final paper stuff. And uh, I would say exercise six is pretty much the foundation for the last... Um, the last two tasks that follow after it, that being exercise seven and the final paper, where we're building this thermal chronology model. So the kind of aim here is to put together some of the pieces we have from earlier in the course and a couple things that we don't yet have to have a fully functional model to predict thermal chronometer ages. And that will allow us to then do things like compare our predicted ages to the ages from the data set you're working with to try to get some idea of how the rates of rock exhumation uh, recorded in the ages from the data set relate to, um, to our thermal models. So this might, I think, sound a bit intimidating, but I think in the end it ends up not being quite as bad as you might, uh, might anticipate. But I will tell you that the first parts of the exercise, there's like kind of a, a decent amount of text here describing what to do. And that's mostly just to kind of make sure that you get headed down the right track. Uh, I don't think the amount of work you have to do is necessarily that challenging, but maybe understanding what you're doing might take a little bit of extra time this time around. What is this? Oh, okay, sorry. This unfamiliar icon. Uh, so yeah, for exercise number six, first part is about filling in the missing pieces. And what I mean by that is putting together the things we don't yet have to have a thermal chronometer age prediction model. Because once we have a thermal chronometer age prediction model, we can compare our predicted ages to what is in our age data set. So for this, what you have here is a sort of overview. This is actually also kind of what was shown in, in the last slide of the overview of exercise six and seven, explaining what we need to be able to do to predict the thermal chronometer age. So we need to be able to create a temperature history or a thermal history for the rock uh, as it cooled during exhumation toward the Earth's surface. So in order to do that, you need to have two things. One is a sort of uh, how long of a model you're running, so how many million years are you running your model, and then the time depth history, which just says if you specify the exhumation rate, you can figure out what depth your rock sample should start at, and then how it travels up toward the surface as it's being exhumed. And then the temperature history for the rock. Once you know the depth where you're at, you can calculate the temperature at the depth using the thermal model, and then you just store that and um, so those are the two things that are part of this kind of temperature history piece. We already have the temperature model from our function from back in, in uh, exercise number four, so we can take advantage of that. The new part is we need to calculate this depth, uh, time depth history, and that's actually not that, that difficult to do. When you have the temperature history, you can then use that to calculate what your effective closure temperature would be, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then once you've got the effective closure temperature, you can figure out what your thermal chronometer age is because you have a temperature history, you have a closure temperature, and you just figure out where in the temperature history did I pass through the closure temperature. And then that will tell you what the age of your rock sample would be. The things that are here in italics like this and the, the point underneath it for points four and five, those are things for exercise number seven. So they're here for the sake of showing you a complete list of what you need to do to have a thermal chronometer age prediction model, but you won't do with, we won't deal with reading in the measured age data or calculating goodness of fit this week. That's something that'll be done in, in exercise number seven. Um, but we will do this calculation of temperatures for the crust uh, so we can plot what the temperature looks like for our geotherm at the start of the model and at the end of the model. And, uh, and then make some plots of the results. So yeah, this as noted might look a little scary, but I think we'll go through it step by step and I hope you'll find it's not, uh, not too overwhelming. Of course, 
Part zero, like the previous uh, five weeks before this, is to copy over your intro QG functions script from exercise five to exercise six, and then run the test cells here to make sure everything's working as expected. Then we have our first step, which is to make this temperature or thermal history function. And what this is going to do is basically use an equation that looks like this that says my depth at any time t is my depth at the previous time minus the velocity times dt. And in this case, because the velocity, I think, is given as a, uh, well, in this case, depth is going to be getting negative uh, as you go deeper. And so the negative value here is just basically going to take your previous depth and then subtract a little bit for it so that you go to a shallower position and move closer toward the surface. So this is our equation to get our depth at any time t for a constant vz, which is what we're going to be working with. We won't implement variable rates of uh, the advection velocity. That's We could do that, but that's more complicated and our equations that we have won't work for for that case. So if you're interested in that, well, that's uh, something for another day, I suppose. <clears throat> So you're given the task here to make this calculate temp history function, and you're given some instructions, for instance, here that tells you basically how to do that. So you're going to make an empty array of zeros uh, called temp history. That you'll just that's going to be where you store the temperatures as you make your temperature history, um, and then you're going to use a loop to go through at each depth and figure out what's my temperature at this depth and store it in your temperature history, and uh, you'll go through all the depths of your uh, time depth history as uh, as part of this um, part of this calculate temp history function. But uh, you're going to loop over it, say what's my depth here, and then you can call this transient temp function from exercise number four to calculate what the temperature is at that depth. Then you store that temp in the corresponding location in the uh, temp history array. So, um, yeah, I think I can, I can illustrate this a bit more if needed, but, but that's the basic idea there. Your calculate temp history function will have five different things that you need to pass into it. One of them is the time history. And uh, this is basically just like, for each of your uh, times where you're doing a calculation, your dt values, um, what your time would uh, be in the model time, depth history, which is what depth you're at at those times, the advection velocity, and the initial geothermal gradient, and then the thermal diffusivity. So these three things are all needed for the thermal model, just like in, in exercise number four. And uh, yeah, that's the first step, is to make that calculate temp history function, which will give us a temperature history, as its name would suggest. Part number two, then, is to use that function, uh, or, sorry, actually to, to use another function to calculate what the closure temperature would be. And this might be kind of sounding a bit uh, confusing because we have the Dodson function to calculate a closure temperature. But the issue here is that when we used the Dodson function before, I always gave you some uh, expected cooling rate. You know, whether it was 10 degrees per million years or one degree per million years, you were given a constant value and then you would calculate what the age would be for this Dodson approach with that cooling rate. The thing here now is we have this cooling history where the cooling rate is going to change as the rock is moving up toward the surface. So what we need to be able to do is to calculate what the cooling rate is for our temperature history as the rock is moving up toward the Earth's surface and then use that to calculate our different thermal chronometer ages. 
So that's essentially what you'll do here. And um, you're given some notes, like there's a function called np.gradient, which will allow you to take your temperature history and convert it to a uh, temp, like a sort of uh, cooling rate instead. So you can use the np.gradient function to do that. And I think there's also a need, maybe it's not here, but in the next one to do the np.flip. Yeah, that's not needed here. But anyway, you can look at the documentation for the NP gradient function if you want to know how that works. But essentially, it just does the derivative of the temperature history. And uh, in this case, when you take the derivative of the temperature history, you get cooling rates uh, from that. And then you're going to loop over your cooling rates to try to figure out uh, what your closure temperature would be and you're given some instructions about how to do that here in in some detail so this is kind of a wall of text but it's worth it to read through this before you start working on each one of these parts because uh, as perhaps comes as no surprise I wrote all this because it's, it's information I think you'll benefit from reading so I try to not leave this too open-ended so please do read through the, the text here it, it will give you some kind of important hints for for doing this part of the the problem but you're given here then a table of for different thermochronometers so there's apatite and zircon uranium thorium helium and then muscovite argon argon and then some of the parameters you need for dodson's equation for each of those so that'll get you your closure temperature Part three is then to get a thermochronometer age from the closure temperature because you'll notice we now have a closure temperature. We have a time temperature history and this is the next step where we then figure out where on that time temperature history did we pass through the closure temperature. And that's essentially what this function is going to do. You'll need to use an interpolation function called np.interp for this. The documentation link is here. And... Uh, there's also a function called np.flip that you'll use to flip the temperature history array to invert the uh, values to put them in increasing order rather than decreasing order, which is what's needed for the interpolation function to work properly. So a couple new NumPy functions, but they're quite simple in the way that you end up using them. So I think it should be hopefully not too tricky to figure out what to do. And finally, at that point, we're going to then test things. You should have all the coding done at the start of part four, and then you're going to plug in some values and see what kind of ages do you end up with. And uh, you're given, for instance, here, an expected closure temperature for the values that are supplied above. So hopefully you'll see that. And also you're given an expected zircon, uranium, thorium, helium age for the same set of values that are given here in the instructions and uh, hopefully you end up with that same age as well. It's a way to test that your function is working properly. So all the coding is in part one or problem number one and then problem number two we're just going to play around a little bit with the model. So I think you run one case where you slow down the advection velocity. I think the example you test with is maybe 0.8 kilometers per million years. In the first part of problem number two, it goes down to 0.4, so half the rate of it. Uh, and you can see how that affects your ages. The second part of problem two, you then double the rate from what it was before to 1.6 kilometers per million years. Let's see how that affects your ages. And then finally, you increase the geothermal gradient with the original rate of 0.8 kilometers per million years and see again how does that affect your your ages I think at that point then there's only the reflection questions that are left so that's exercise number six any questions or thoughts about this at this point concerns Does it seem clear kind of what in general what you're going to be doing here? No. 
Okay. All right, that's good. So jumping back to the course page, you'll see if you've been on there today that the final paper information is now listed as well. So underneath lesson six, okay, of course, lesson seven will get put in here next week, but I've, the final report stuff, final paper is already here. Um, and yeah, a couple things. I'll actually maybe one thing about exercise six before we go on. And that is that exercise number six, due date is a week from Wednesday this week. So giving you a couple extra days for that one, especially because exercise five's due date is pushed. Uh, this is due Wednesday, a week from, from this Wednesday. But yes, then the final paper. So the info is on the course page. The basic idea here is to kind of write up a summary of exercises six and seven and talk a little bit about the age data you were working with in the style of a sort of scientific report. So lengthwise, if you convert it to pages, it's about six to eight pages in total, including figures and references and things like that. However, this is uh, based on single spacing of the lines. I'll tell you that there's quite a few figures you'll probably put in there. Those are going to be like at least probably four figures you'll have from the lab report or from the lab exercises. So the amount of text is not going to be huge, but there's, um, yeah, it's on the order of like six to eight pages in length. And uh, that includes text and figures. I guess the references and appendix could be on an, uh, uh, additional pages if needed. So you can write this up in like, you know, your word favorite word processor if you want to, or there is also a template for a Jupyter notebook that you can use for the final report. And I would actually prefer you do that if you're willing to try it. Um, so maybe I'll just show you what this template looks like. Um, it is here. It basically has the kind of general structure of the paper in a Jupyter notebook. So there's a place where you can put your title, your name, whatever the date is. Um, and then it's sort of instruction cell that you can delete before you submit the, the paper that kind of gives an overview of how long it should be. So like 2,000 to 2,500 words is roughly six to eight pages of text with the figures and all that. And uh, yeah, in here, you'll see the same information that I'm just about to go through on the course page about the different sections like the abstract, introduction, etc. All that stuff is here, and you can basically delete the text that's in, that's in italics and just write your text into the markdown cells here. The reason I would suggest doing this is that you kind of can take advantage of what a Jupyter Notebook can do. So you can call your functions inside of here to make the plots. So you don't have to like make some image file and put it into a Word document, but you can just have a call to your function that produces one of your plots and put that plot directly inside the notebook it just as a code cell that produces some output. Um, I mean, essentially everything you can do in a Word document, you can, you can do inside of a Jupyter notebook uh, as well, but you can also have the code cells, which is kind of a nice thing to, to do. So that template exists and yeah. It is LaTeX style in terms of the, the syntax for equations. Um, let me, I'll just open a, uh, just give me a second here. I'll open a, ah, it's gonna ask me for my password. All right. But yeah, I'll show you just an example maybe. So here's our quantitative geology. CSC notebooks environment. So yeah, if you've typeset equations in LaTeX before, it's basically the same syntax you use in LaTeX. But you have to identify somehow in the notebook that it should format that text as an equation, not just as text. So that's the kind of key thing here. So uh, let's hide this and make this bigger. So if I make this a markdown cell, 
I can, you know, add some heading, blah, blah, blah. And if I want to have an equation in here, basically you have to put it in dollar signs. And then I could say like, um, let me think of a good example. So, uh, And if you haven't used LaTeX equation type setting before, this is probably going to be a bit confusing. Uh, and we'll see whether I can do this on the fly and remember properly. But, uh, oops, that didn't, what is the infinity? Is it just, no doesn't know that one. All right, well, let's make it to 100. Um, and then I can also make this large. So basically, if you put it inside of dollar signs like that, you can have typeset math inside of a cell like this, which is nice because you could then have, you know, like... Um, Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of a good example of like an, a sentence. So, uh, in my model, I assume, and then like oftentimes you might want to have like a sort of closure temperature. Maybe you write it as like TC equals 150 and then you've got to do the degree sign in LaTeX which is always weird uh, something like that so you can look at the example maybe I'll put the notebook on the, the course page so you can see this but you can typeset things in line like this which is nice um, but you can also do things like if you want to have, I think, I don't know if you have to do a double dollar sign for this one, but you can also uh, use the align environment in LaTeX to have something like uh, x equals, equals 3y plus y. squared. I lost my y. Um, and if you've ever used this align environment in LaTeX, you could then say like the ampersand will be used to align things. And so you could have like, I don't know, something like that I think should work uh, as long as you have the end align part. <laughs> which I'm missing. So you can also have like this kind of uh, aligned equations. I don't think it does equation numbering if I remember correctly. Because uh, the align envir environment will use like the ampersand sign to line up equations like yeah. so that they, they work like that. Um, but I think if you do, if you just do the equation, uh, y equals sine of x. I don't think it does equation numbers, no. Uh, and I actually think that it might not even need these dollar signs. I'm not 100% sure that it doesn't. Yeah, it can actually parse that with the, the LaTeX code like that. Um, I get a little bit mixed up because the getting equations to show up on the course page. We also write all the course web page material in Jupyter Notebooks. And there you have to wrap them in dollar signs or else it doesn't should, like get converted to the web page properly. But at least within the notebook like this, it would be 
fine to do that and you can basically just put in your normal lock tag if you want to write you know put in matrices and whatever you can you can do it so um but yeah i think to do inline things like this i think you do have to wrap this in dollar signs it won't recognize that as an equation without being wrapped in dollar signs but if it finds this kind of begin tag like begin align it, it it knows that that's a lot tech equation inside there so it has some kind of parsing for that but like for inline equations you have to wrap them in dollar signs otherwise it won't get handled properly and what's nice if you're curious is you can right click on them and you can actually uh there's other ways you can modify things so like if you hover you can make it so it zooms the equation so there's like it uses this MathJax plugin to do things. So um, there's yeah different things you can do with it. And what's actually kind of nice, just in case you're interested, if you ever find a web page where they're using this kind of uh, Jupyter notebooks to produce the documentation, is you can actually get the tech commands from. Uh, this is really small. I don't know how to make that. Okay, it's going to make everything stupid big in the other one. But you can get the LaTeX code that was used to produce the equation. So, like, sometimes if I find something where I want to borrow an equation off of a web page and I don't want to try and type set the whole nasty thing, you can actually just grab the whole equation from this MathJax plugin, which is, at least to me, that's pretty nice. Um, so. But, yeah, good question. Um, back to where we were, I guess, here. So in terms of the structure, there's a short abstract, something like not longer than 250 words, where you're basically saying, you know, what is this report about? Um, your job is basically to talk about this age data set that you've been dealing with. And uh, you'll have an introduction part here where you can talk about maybe a little bit of background about the, um, the area and whatever. The basic idea is to try to get some exhumation rates from these ages so you can kind of describe in general what you're trying to do with that um, and you can use things like from the lecture notes and from other references to uh, to write the introductory part um, and then you know maybe at the end wrap up with a paragraph that says like something about how the exercise relates to the stated problem like we're going to use the code from exercises six and seven to do blah 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 to calculate exhumation rates then there's a short section about geological background. A couple paragraphs there might be useful to kind of describe like what are the kind of things that are influencing the exhumation rates like active faults. Uh, it's an area where there's a lot of rainfall. So you maybe want to mention that like it's rapidly eroding, steep topography, blah, blah, blah. But there's some references for that as well. And then a section where you can describe the methods. This is basically just describing a little bit of what you've done in the exercise. So like what equations are you solving? What kind of things are you doing? Maybe you want to mention something about Dodson's approach and those kind of things. And then you'll have some figures where you're showing some plots of things you've calculated from exercises six and seven. And then your discussion section where you can talk about things like how do the exhumation rates vary for the different thermal chronometers and how well do the model predictions and the, the measured ages compare to one another. Maybe you could talk something about like what are the limitations? Like we're using a one-dimensional thermal model. Are there problems with with that? Um, and uh, there's some just kind of it's op more open-ended for you to comment on what you like there for the discussion section. And then a short summary, some references. Key thing here maybe is that this list should include at least five primary sources. So these are non-Wikipedia type things, but like journal articles or textbooks. And then an appendix where you can either copy paste your code or if you're using the the template as the Jupyter notebook you can basically just include that as part of the repository that you put the intro, intro QG functions code into your uh, final paper repository and then that way you can just say in the appendix that the, the code used in this exercise is available in the intro QG functions Python script and there is an assessment uh, document here, this PDF. If you want to know how your score is going to be determined, 
Um, you can look here and see how many points are given for different sections of the um, of the paper and also kind of what things I'm looking for in those different sections to give you some idea of how to, to divide your effort in writing this final project paper up. So you can find that linked as well in uh, here in the basic information about the final paper. Then about some scientific articles, if you need help finding some, uh, you're supposed to use five. I think there are nine articles that are here on the web page linked. So you don't necessarily need to go out and see, like search for other literature. Of course, you're welcome to do so if you'd like. But um, there's a handful of papers here that are about general things about thermal chronology, some things about the sort of geology of the Himalaya, and uh, then a couple papers that are more specific to the data that we're working with. So both of these, um, this uh, paper by Couton in uh, 2014, and then this uh, paper by Stuve and Foster in 2001, those are both the sources of the data that you're using in the exercise and in the final report. So uh, those are useful perhaps to cite as the sources for the data set that you're, you're analyzing. All right, how about any questions now? So, um, yeah, those are the tasks at hand. The due date for the final paper is nominally the 12th of January. So I wanted to give a couple weeks time that was not holidays after the class ends. So uh, that should give you a bit of time to take a proper Christmas break, but then also be able to, uh, to work on the paper. So uh, I think that's a Friday, five o'clock on the Friday is when the final papers due. And a lot of the stuff you'll take will be from exercises six and seven that go into the paper in terms of the figures. But the idea with this is to put some of the results you produce in the exercise into a bigger geological context by reading a few papers and getting a sense of what are people doing who are doing research in this area currently. And, uh, and you'll see that you know we're using a simplified version of the code and the models that, that are being used uh, by, by other researchers, but it's not really that different from what people are actually applying and using to interpret their age data um, currently. So, yeah, any, anything else at this point? You guys seem kind of low energy today. Is that me or is that you or Mondays? Aren't you supposed to come back on Monday and excited for school and <laughs> Yeah, okay. That's fair enough. Uh, okay. Well, um, yeah, that's all I have. So if you have any questions about anything at this point, you can come catch me now. Otherwise, same deal as always, we'll have the exercise help session on Friday. If there's questions, uh, you can put them in Discord. And I'm sorry, I'll put the videos for last week and today up as soon as, uh, soon as I can. And I'll try, I'll also, I, I guess, do you want this example notebook with these LaTeX equations or is it just something I can put into the, like, I, I could also just like put a link into Discord, for instance, of like a page where you can see how to make equations in LaTeX. That might be better because you'll find better examples than what I just came up with on the fly. So, okay. See you guys next week.